Well, good afternoon. Um, it's just a little bit past two o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. So we'll go ahead and get started with our In the Swine Barn series with South Dakota State University and Washington State University Extension. Um, today's topic, we're gonna talk about what is African swine fever and what can you do to protect your pigs in the event that this um, disease was to show up here in the US. Um, this is something we've hoped we would never have to talk about, but I think we're better to be prepared rather than trying to uh, start this discussion after we have a problem. Um, I know oftentimes this isn't quite as exciting as some of the other topics we might not talk about, but might be the most critical when you start thinking about um, keeping our pigs healthy and also access to markets. Uh, we have Dr. Ryan Samuel uh, with us from South Dakota State University. He helps uh, co-coordinate this uh, program. And next month, he will be leading the charge with a reproductive and artificial insemination webinar. We have Jamie Sackman with us from the Washington Pork Producers. Uh, she serves as the treasurer. She also helps moderate these um, webinars and helps take the questions and make sure that everything runs smoothly. So I greatly appreciate them. Our speaker today will be Dr. Pam Zagel from the National Pork Board. She is the Director of Swine Health and has a lot of experience um, both with the swine diseases and trying to mitigate these and be prepared in the event we were to be forced to uh, deal with a foreign animal disease. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a quick poll, and then I will turn it over to you, Dr. Zabel. So I'm going to launch the poll. Um, the first question is, do you have a written biosecurity um, plan for your farm? Um, and uh, you can answer any one of those, just trying to get an idea. I know a lot of us think in terms of biosecurity, but the, the key here is, do you have a written down a plan that uh, you use? So go ahead and uh, click on which one you think is the most applicable to your... The second question is, do you have a written uh, daily log of your herd health? Um, so do you keep a log of uh, not only just kind of your general herd health, but treatment plans? Um, and do you keep that documented? And then the third question is, how are you involved with the production of pigs? Is it through a commercial pig production operation, doing direct sales and niche marketing, show pig production or a youth producer, involved through education and extension, um, either as an extension uh, faculty person or through our FFA or state outreach programs or regulation and uh, of state and federal requirements. So it looks like we have some uh, individuals that uh, have got some written uh, biosecurity plans. Uh, some people are wanting to look at how they can get them wrote down. Um, and the same would go to say about our herd health plans um, some some have it on their list to do, and others are starting to document what they're doing. And we have a nice representation of producers who are doing direct marketing, some show pigs, education, and regulation, Dr. Zabel. So we kind of have a nice, well-rounded group. So with that, if you have any questions, go ahead and please feel free to uh, type them in the question and answer and Jamie will make sure that those get asked. If you have any issues with your platform, go ahead and put those in the chat and I will deal with them. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Zabel, and you can go ahead and lead us through this discussion. I'm going to share my screen and I have to pause there. It's kind of ironic. I did graduate from Iowa State University, um, both my undergrad and DVM degree. Um, I have one child that graduated from there and one child that actually goes to the University of Iowa. And it is the weekend of the big intrastate rivalry between Iowa and Iowa State. So we are a house divided. It will be interesting to see 
how it turns out after tomorrow afternoon. Hopefully it all stays on the field. <laughs> I hope so. Um, so thank you for joining me as I talk to you this afternoon about the Secure Pork Supply and using some of the resources provided through the Secure Pork Supply um, plan to prepare for an ASF outbreak. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, just a brief overview on African swine fever and why we're so concerned about that particular virus. Um, a little bit about what happens if we get ASF here and how the response plays out. Um, talk about uh, secure pork supply when it came to being and, and the different components to it and how you can use those resources that are developed within secure pork to prepare on your farm. So ASF virus um, is a virus that infects only domestic and feral swine. It doesn't affect any other um, of our domestic species. What the concern around this virus is that it is a rather large virus, um, which has made it difficult to develop a vaccine um, or a treatment for this virus. So uh, currently there is no vaccine. There are some in the works, um, a couple that show promise um, that have been developed through um, the Agricultural Research uh, Service, but um, ARS, but um, at this point they aren't commercialized. And so while we have hope that there will be coming one coming down the pipe, um, it's not going to be something that's going to happen immediately for us uh, in the event that we do end up with an ASF outbreak. It's always important to note that um, ASF virus is not a public health or food safety concern, that the people working with the animals during an outbreak, uh, the meat that we ate, eat is all safe. Um, there could be some public concerns um, if we do get it here and um, the, the consumer sees us responding to this disease outbreak that affects only animals um, and, and they may become concerned. So that's a message that we all need to carry is that it is not a public health or food safety concern. And the other big thing is that uh, this is a virus that we need to report. It is a trade restricting disease. And immediately when we uh, would be diagnosed in the United States with this virus, we would lose our export markets. Why is that so important? Well, at this time, uh, more than $58.65 of value per hog comes from those export markets. And that was, uh, those are 2020 numbers. And so it is important, um, I believe it's around 27% or so of the pork produced in the United States is exported. And so if we lose those exports, that would um, have a huge impact on the, the amount of pork than we would have on the domestic market. So what might that look like depending on how long we would be infected? Um, so again, we'd have that closure of an international market to US pork. This is a study um, that you can see there that uh, titled impacts of ASF in Iowa and the United States from last year. And they looked at two different scenarios. The first scenario was what if we got the disease and we were able to eradicate it within two years? Um, and we were able to then re-enter the export market. They estimated through modeling that our revenue losses would add up to around $15 billion and that there would be low employment losses within the industry if we could clean it up within two years. However, they did an all year scenario, they called it, which um, in that when they modeled that the virus spread to feral pigs and that the US was unable to eliminate the virus over the 10 year period, which is how long they projected the modeling out. They estimated revenue losses would be over $50 billion. And the, the other important thing to note is that they estimated that the industry would downsize after about five years of losses and it would remain low, um, losing about uh, 140,000 jobs. Um, we would also see an immediate impact in both of the scenarios of a 40 to 50% reduction in live swine hog prices, again, due to the loss of exports and the surplus here on the domestic market. So uh, a lot of times when we talk about the clinical signs associated with ASF, which you can see here, um, they can resemble many of the clinical signs of our endemic diseases. We used to be under the thinking that um, the virulent form of ASF, if we got it here, we would walk into a barn and there'd be a large number of pigs that would be dead. And we would immediately, you know, light bulbs would go off and oh my gosh, we've got African swine fever. But what we've learned in watching this virus and what we're hearing in other countries um, reports back are that at least initially when it enters a farm or a herd, 
it's slower um, and that you may see one dead, you may see some of these signs again that resemble our domestic diseases. And it, it, the concern is that we may um, assume that it is a domestic disease like PERS or salmonella and the red flags might not go off immediately. Um, and in this, in order to um, be able to get this virus under control, we need to be able to identify it as quickly as possible in the United States when it enters a herd. On necropsy, um, there are a couple things that we uh, tend to look for when we post these pigs. You can see for the spleen there on the left, a normal spleen. It's kind of a tongue-like organ that hides behind the rib cage and the abdomen. It's usually more of a pinkish color, um, crisp lines on the side, but in, in an ASF infected animal, the spleen is usually quite large, uh, dark purple and breaks apart really easily. The lymph nodes are found throughout the body. This is just a, a picture of them in one location you can see in the bottom left there. They're kind of a pea to grape size structure, more of a flesh to light pinky color under normal conditions. We find in pigs that are ASF positive that these um, lymph nodes can be very large, um, larger, uh, and, and darker to purple in color. And so um, it's important that if we see any kind of signs like this on necropsy, that these animals get tested. I mean, and it's also important if we see the clinical signs associated with ASF that we also do the testing just to make sure that we're, we're not getting the virus here. The other concern that we have um, with this virus is its ability to survive. It is highly resistant in the environment, especially at lower temperatures. It can survive in fecal matter at room temperature for several days, in contaminated pens for months, um, blood up to 18 months, pork products like hams um, for 140 days, and in frozen carcasses for years. And what they're finding in some parts, especially in Eastern Europe, in the wild pigs, um, is that animals that die and, and freeze and they'll go and they'll um, test the bone marrow in those animals and they'll find the virus. And so there's a, a concern that, uh, that the virus can survive in frozen carcasses for an extended period of time. What about spread? How do we spread this virus? Well, if we got the virus here, we would really worry about direct contact with infected pigs. So of course, all the other animals on the farm. Um, it's usually uh, any form of excretion, secretion, blood or tissue is infectious. So the saliva, the eye discharge, <clears throat> this, the, eye, the nasal discharge, the eye secretions, um, we worry a lot about the blood. If we necropsy these animals and they're positive, that's a lot of infectious tissue and blood that we've just exposed to the environment. But anytime there's direct contact with that infected pig, we have potential for spread of ASF. We, of course, also have the ability to spread it on ourselves, um, and that's what we're seeing in a lot of parts of the world, that people are the ones moving the virus around on our clothing and footwear, on our vehicles and our equipment, and through our supplies. In addition, um, there is a vector, the soft tick, the ornithodorous tick. Um, this plays a, a big role in tick-to-pig transmission in Africa. Um, we do have soft ticks here in the United States. Um, it's uncertain if they'll really play a role in transmission because what we found is that uh, the warthogs in Africa live in burrows. And so they get a tick uh, population in these burrows. And if the warthogs leave and other uh, warthogs come back into those burrows, those ticks are still infected and will infect those new animals into the burrows. And that's not exactly how our feral pigs in the United States behave. And so we're not sure um, what the role of these sock ticks might be in the United States. And um, it, it's just not the way that the feral pigs move here as far as what the tick role might be. Um, we've also found that uh, it, it doesn't seem that the, the tick is really playing a role in transmission in Eastern Europe or in parts of Asia either. Um, we do worry about mechanical vectors like mosquitoes and biting flies that can um, bite a infected animal and then go on to bite a, a non-infected animal and infect that animal. Of course, another big concern we have is the ingestion of contaminated pork products. So pigs fed um, plate waste that hasn't been treated, heated up correctly, or if there is an infected animal at some point, that uh, they come in contact with the, in, uh, an uninfected animal comes in contact with the carcass of an infected animal. And so would that be a way that it could get into our feral pigs or move around the feral pig population? 
So how could it enter the United States? We've talked about spread. That could be international spread. That could be domestic spread. Um, so what are our biggest concerns for ASF entering the United States? Well, smuggling is one of them. And we rely a lot on the great job that Customs and Border Protection has been doing. This is just one example. Um, this was a grab that they had in April to June of last year. They intercepted almost 20,000 pounds of prohibited pork, chicken, beef, and duck. Um, came through the LA Long Beach seaport from China. And you can see the whole list of things that it was commingled. So clearly it was hidden um, with the intent of smuggling it in. And that's the quote there that um, the individual with Customs and Border Protection. So, um, you know, you can look at pictures of any one day of products that are brought in on, on travelers that they bring with them or products that are smuggled in different ways through um, that we rely on our Customs and Border Protection to pick up on those cases. Again, as I said, we worry about people um, that travel internationally and coming into the United States and in addition to their footwear and their clothing, but also the items that they bring with them. So there was a study, this was in 2019, where they looked at the risk of ASF entering the US through the smuggling of products and air passenger luggage. They determined that the, <clears throat> the risk had uh, doubled since the ASF epidemic began in China in 2018. Five airports they determined had over 90% of that risk. You can see them listed there and that they felt there was a high probability that the virus is actually reaching our borders, but not entering due to the great job that Customs and Border Protection is doing. Another possible way, uh, entry point that could occur is through feedstuffs. <clears throat> One thing that we have to understand is that in some countries, they have a different way that they dry grain. And the way that they dry grain and, and lay it out on the road or on uh, dirt surfaces and so on is that it could expose the grain to people, animals, and vehicles. And so that's, of course, an opportunity for disease spread. So if we are uh, importing grains from ASF positive countries of which the countries are drying their grains in this manner, it of course could be a risk of bringing the, the virus along with the grain. And so <clears throat> Pork Board has uh, spent a lot of resources looking at what holding time, additives to mitigate risk, and what other options we have to uh, limit the possibility of bringing the virus in through feedstuff importation. So where is it in the world? It's never been reported in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Australia, or New Zealand. Um, for a long time, it just remained in Africa and it has been on the island of Sardinia. There have been other countries that have been positive um, and that have went and cleaned it up over the years. Um, but when we really started worrying and watching the movement started in 2007, and it started in uh, the Republic of Georgia and spread on up through um, the country of Azerbaijan and on up through slow trek up through Eastern Europe. Um, you can see here on the map, um, just some of the different um, outbreaks that they've seen or cases that they've diagnosed. But then uh, it really became concerning in 2018 when China of course broke, it's been three years now. And then following of course the, the China outbreak, several countries in Asia um, also had outbreaks as well as uh, you know, our most recent discussion is the uh, cases diagnosed in the Dominican Republic, uh, the end of July, um, first time in over 40 years that the virus has been in the Western hemisphere. So what happens if ASF is diagnosed in the United States? So on day one that the announcement is made, uh, the OIE, World Organization for Animal Health is notified and, uh, and our member countries and all of our exports of swine and uncooked products will be stopped. Um, animal health officials will start setting up control areas and they'll start working to manage the movements. As we've discussed, the prices of pork and pork products will drop. And again, that consumer confidence is at risk that we mentioned, um, you know, they're gonna watch us responding to a livestock disease and we have to make sure our message is clear that it doesn't affect um, human, health, human health at all. So in that response, um, there's a lot of states that are talking about in, in, at, at the national level, a national standstill order. And what would happen during that period is no new live animals or semen movements would be initiated. Um, and for 72 hours, um, animals again would not be allowed to, to move. However, all the animals on the road 
um, would be allowed to uh, continue to their destination if the destination would so allow it. So um, some states talk about a grace period, but um, the idea that any animals that are already on the road need to land somewhere and if they could continue on to their destination so that um, we make sure that those animals are taken care of. Then again, there's been a little bit of um, discussion on the length of that grace period, if that would be tacked on to a 72 hour standstill. So those are being uh, still being discussed. But during that standstill, um, animal health officials will be looking for the disease. They will be trying to determine beyond the initial infected premises, where has the disease spread? Are there contact premises? Um, are there epidemiologic links there? Did animals move off that premises or did they come from somewhere? And there's gonna be um, a lot of diagnostic testing going on and a lot of epidemiological investigations trying to find out where the disease is and where it isn't. Around those infected premises, they'll be setting up infected and buffer zones, which make up a control area. And within that area, movement controls will be put in place. Only um, animals and semen and some animal products as far as um, like, um, manure and um, possibly carcass disposal, those uh, items will only be allowed to move under a movement permit. So that's where the secure food supply plans come into play. They focus on that business continuity for those sites that are affected by that quarantine in that control area, but they're actually not infected by the disease. So what does it look like um, when movement opens back up? So after we get past the 72 hour standstill, which could be extended depending on how long it takes to do the diagnostics and the epidemiological investigation and setting up those control areas, then the idea would be that movement resumes. And within those control areas, that controlled movement um, will only happen with enhanced biosecurity, surveillance, traceability, and with movement permits. I have the picture of the airplane here. Um, I've used this for years when I talk about secure pork, but it's, it's so timely with 9-11. Um, and, and I don't mean to, um, to, to compare this to, to everything that happened in 9-11 with the exception that it helps people understand that the trucks need to land somewhere um, during this standstill movement of a standstill order, that the trucks that are in transit need to land, just like the planes needed to land in 9-11. Some of them continued on to their airport destination, some landed somewhere in between, but it was important that the airplanes land. And it's important that these animals get to their destination or have somewhere that they can go for welfare purposes along the way. Um, and then after, again, that, that standstill order, um, as the planes were grounded for several days while additional security measures were put into place, during that standstill order, it's important that we enhance our biosecurity if we haven't already done so, that we start implementing our surveillance approaches, start um, doing our trace back and trace forwards off our sites. And again, those animals are only gonna be allowed to move under a movement permit if they're in that control area. So enter secure pork supply plan. We're gonna talk again a little bit about how it fits into that response. And again, I'm gonna break out the components of secure pork a little bit more for you. So the secure pork supply plan was developed, um, started many years ago, second to the egg producers. And what happened is the egg producers found that when, when there were discussions um, on high path AI and what those response plans would look like, that they were gonna get caught up in a control area and not be able to sell their eggs even though they weren't infected. And so they went to USDA and said, hey, what would it take to convince you these sites that are negative are negatives so that you'll let us move eggs? And so they were the first of the secure food supply plans. And then secure pork, um, the pork producers realized what was happening in the egg industry. Um, and then milk came along also prior to pork. And um, the pork producers said, hey, um, we're gonna get caught up in these control areas too. What would it take to convince you um, that, that our animals are negative? And again, um, you know, it's different with eggs, moving eggs versus moving milk in the silver bullet versus moving live animals. And so um, quite a task that we were all looking at to develop these, these secure pork supply plans. So they are guidance. They have been developed uh, with collaboration with animal health officials, producers, state agencies, veterinarians. Um, it's a voluntary program. Again, it was funded through USDA, started the funding. Pork Checkoff has contributed some funds along the way, and we'll go through what some of those resources look like. 
But first, let's talk about traceability. One thing that we always talk about first is to make sure that producers have that premises identification number or PIN. And you can get that through the Washington State Department of Agriculture. It needs to reflect that 911 address, the latitude and the longitude. And what producers can do ahead of time is start associating that PIN with their animal movement records and their diagnostic laboratory submissions, because that's something that is going to happen and need to happen in an outbreak. Just like in many cases, um, some of your like your tax records and so on are associated with so your social security number. The information for each premises is going to be associated with their premises identification number. So you want to make sure that's accurate and you want to start um, associating it with those submissions and movement records now to get in the habit of it. Some of the problems that we're finding with pins over the years have been it, it includes the wrong 911 address associated with the site. Um, for some places, they may have a house um, at a different address than where the farm is, and they include the house address rather than where the animals are actually located. They may have multiple sites, and so they may try to include those all under one pin. Um, that's something that I encourage producers to talk to their state animal health officials about. Some states like to see uh, different pins for sites that are uh, over a quarter of a mile apart. Um, some uh, have different feelings depending on the how the sites are laid out in, in their state. So um, it, the only concern that we talk about is if there's multiple sites under that one pin and there's laboratory submissions and they come up positive, then all the sites that are associated with that pin are going to appear positive until they can tease out all the links and help them understand that it's two different sites that, that may not be tied together. Um, and again, it, that pin has to reflect the actual location of the animals. A little bit about record keeping. It's important to record your animal movements, um, maintain a visitor logbook, and be prepared to track any other movements on and off the site. So that could be um, uh, feed trucks coming on. It could be other kinds of deliveries, um, you know, your visitor log, any people, and that could include um, anybody that's helping with manure removal. It could be anybody coming as far as maintenance to help fix anything on the site, um, that sort of thing. So it's good to track that because sometimes they go from one site to another and that could be part of an epidemiological link that you may have with another site. Um, electronic re records are preferred because they can be shared easily, but we also have a way to share some of these other documents. I'll talk to you in a little bit when I get to ag view here as far as some of the paper copies. Those uh, forms are found on the Secure Pork website at securepork.org. This is what the website looks like. If you go to the producer tab at the top, you can see the movement record um, tab on the left and there's um, three of the different logs we have available. And again, these are available through PQA Plus. We went through a few years ago and worked with um, those that update PQA Plus to get those that apply to both to have the Secure Pork Supply logo on them. So let's talk a little bit about disease monitoring or surveillance. There's a term we use within Secure Pork called the swine health monitors. And these are caretakers, producers, individuals on the farm that take care of the pigs every day. Um, you as producers are the ones that look at your animals. And we just ask that you become familiar with what the clinical signs are for the different diseases. And we have resources for those. Um, and, and understand the abnormal production parameters. You know, if they're, they're laying around more, if they're not eating, if they're not drinking, um, you know, those are all red flags. And, and just to make sure that you always look at those daily um, and that you call someone if you have concerns that these production parameters are out of whack. Uh, so some of the resources that we have, again, if you go to that um, web page is that you, um, it kind of links you to the pork store where you can order those. Um, if anyone contacts me, we can make sure we get some sent out your way um, it, available for producers. So they do come as push packs. Um, there's laminated posters for African swine fever, classical swine fever, foot mouth disease, and some biosecurity posters I'm gonna talk to you about in a minute. They do come also in English and Spanish. Uh, in order to acquire a movement permit, uh, samples will also need to be taken um, from the animals on your farms, and those, of course, will need to test negative to, for that movement permit to be issued. You will find we have some resources there um, on the Secure Pork website. 
We are working with a farm bill grant to develop some of the resources to help train some of the people on the farm to be able to collect some of their own diagnostic samples. So this is just an example of what one of the bleeding videos and handouts look like. So now a little bit deeper into biosecurity. So biosecurity is so important. Um, the UK farmers with good biosecurity years ago during the FMD outbreak were five times less likely to become infected if they had good biosecurity practices in play. So biosecurity is one way that you can help protect the animals on your farm. I'm gonna cover just some high level biosecurity things within Secure Pork. You go to the website, you're gonna find a lot of resources don't get overwhelmed. Um, they're not all needed to develop your plans. A lot of them are just extra resources that are there to help you maybe clarify some things, provide other guidance. Um, if you're having trouble figuring out how to implement something, just additional resources, but they're not all um, something that you have to look at or fill out in order to have a, a good biosecurity plan on your site. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the biosecurity manager, a written site-specific biosecurity plan and how to protect the pigs. A couple of new concepts you may never have heard about, a perimeter buffer area and another one called the line of separation. So the biosecurity manager is someone that understands infectious diseases, uh, production animal agriculture is familiar with the facility. Um, in many cases, it can be the producer working on the plan. It could be um, someone else, an extension agent and so on that helps write the plan. We always ask you to loop in the herd veterinarian who of course understands um, how uh, diseases move around and the different risk factors. We do have biosecurity templates available. We'll talk about those in a minute. But the idea is that the biosecurity manager can work on writing the site-specific biosecurity plan. Um, so the idea is to have it in writing of the different measures you're taking on your farm to help prevent disease entry and reduce your risk, um, as well as making sure that it happens every day. Um, and, and don't feel overwhelmed, we'll break this apart just a little bit. But again, that idea that um, the only way we're gonna prevent these diseases from entering is if we're practicing good biosecurity um, every day because we never know when they're a threat. And that includes um, also uh, another responsibility is the employee training or producer training. So these templates are available at securepork.org. Um, they, were, they were written, um, to help guide a producer through writing a biosecurity plan. They're available in type or write-in formats. I would strongly encourage you to use the type in form because that way it'll be much easier for you to update um, your plan as you move forward versus writing it in and then uh, only having a paper copy. Um, but again, it, it guides producers through writing that biosecurity plan. Um, you'll see a map there in the bottom left. That is one of the parts of the biosecurity plan is that producers are asked to take an aerial view of their farm, draw some different lines in um, to help think through how you could reduce the risk of things that come on your site. Um, this is one that I did. I, I was in practice for many years, and this is uh, an aerial view of someone who was a client of mine at the time. Those are two finisher buildings. You can see there that they always drove between the buildings and to um, increase the level of biosecurity on their site, they would be better off making a path around the buildings so that when they move between the buildings, they're not walking through the area where the feed truck drives, um, the, where they remove deads and so on. And so again, just kind of thinking through um, how you could increase the level of biosecurity on your site. This is where the templates are available. And again, this is just a small snapshot of what the biosecurity page looks like. Just go to that customizable templates. We do have one for animals raised indoors only. And then we also have one that is a combination of animals raised indoors and animals with outdoor access. The perimeter buffer area, it is an area that is around the animal building serving as an outdoor control boundary. So again, it, it may be, uh, there's no defined distance of what that perimeter buffer area is. It's much easier to install a perimeter buffer area around buildings or um, enclosures that are smaller versus, of course, as you can imagine, a large pasture, it would be hard to have that buffer area around a pasture. Um, when there is a perimeter buffer area in place, um, the idea is that you only enter through the marked and controlled access points and you follow biosecurity measures. So again, it's that idea that we are keeping an area around 
the buildings or around the enclosures, that we reduce the amount of the viral load so that when people move around in those, there's less likely that they're gonna drag the virus into the buildings or into the enclosure. The line of separation, some people still refer to it as a clean, dirty line. In many cases, it's the walls of the building for animals that are housed indoors. For animals that have outdoor access, it may be the fence or the gates. Um, and again, people only cross through specific areas um, what we call access points following those biosecurity measures. So what might that look like on an aerial map? I have a couple different examples here. I know it's hard for you to read the little print, but you kind of get the idea. The example on the right is a pasture example. To put a perimeter buffer area where you keep things out of that area surrounding the fence would be very difficult. But you can still up your biosecurity game by treating that line of separation or that entire um, fence and respect its boundaries and only enter through, you know, in many cases, you're gonna only enter through the gate. And so when they go through the gate, um, you follow specific biosecurity measures to make sure that you're not dragging disease into where the animals are housed in that pasture. You can see in the example on the left, these are two hoop buildings. And in this case, the producer was able to draw a perimeter buffer area. And what that gave them was the ability to move um, between their compost pile and their buildings when they have deads um, to be able to not worry about crossing traffic with the feed delivery truck um, or others coming and going. And so they uh, were able to draw that line of separation and only have that be the gates. Um, they were gonna feed and water the animals over the gates so that people don't climb the fence anywhere other than a specific location. So there are ways um, with animals with outdoor access to increase your biosecurity um, as long as you make a conscience effort to um, restrict people from crossing in areas they shouldn't and that they follow their biosecurity measures when they do enter the animal areas. Where does AgView fit into the big picture? Well, AgView is a dashboard and it is a um, tool that uh, has been built through pork, off, uh, pork check off dollars and uh, producers can create a check view, an AgView account, producers of any size, can create their AgView account and they can step, start uploading their information. And so the information can be anything from your biosecurity plan when you have one written to your movement data. And all of that information is only seen by you. And the only way that it is shared is through your permission. And so in the event that we do get a disease, one of these um, trade restriction, restricting diseases here in the United States, um, and you are asked to share your information you have to grant permission for them to see your information before it is ever shared. You have the control over who sees your information. And so the idea behind getting the information uploaded now helps saves time in the event of an outbreak in case you're ever asked to share it. So I would encourage everyone to get an AgView account at this time. What it can do is um, let the animal health officials, once you give permission, they can see your data. So they can see your biosecurity plan if that's what they chose to look at. They can see your animal movements. And for those movements that come in electronically, they're mapped out. And so they can see where animals have been and um, animals that have left the site, animals that have, have come to the site. And so they can really get that full picture on trying to assess where the disease is and where they need to look at um, to see if there has been disease spread. So again, it's another tool in the response effort. It's a dashboard um, for the animal health officials to use to, to look at the incident situation. So I'm gonna go quickly over some inputs and outputs for your consideration. I've done a lot of workshops with producers where they bring their aerial map and they sit down with a, a biosecurity plan. And we talk through that, during the workshop, usually um, it, it, takes, it takes more time for you to build a biosecurity plan. I don't wanna mislead you that we could sit down and develop them in a short workshop time because a lot of it requires just a thought process for how you can approach these things on your site. And so I always challenge the producers and challenge you all to, as we go through this, to think of these inputs and outputs on your farms and how you could either reduce the, the um, frequency that that risk presents or what biosecurity measures can you put around that, um, that input or that output. So the first one we're gonna talk about is animal and semen movement. And of course, animals are gonna move on and off the site. And so how can we reduce the risk of the animals moving on and off the site? Are there things we can do 
um, as far as equipment wise, personnel wise, and when it comes to semen movement, that we can get that semen on the site without worrying about bringing a virus with it. What about feed deliveries and storage? Uh, what we talk about in Secure Pork is to make sure that the feed arrives um, in a secure uh, truck or bags or whatnot to make sure that then it is stored in such a manner also. So the picture in the wagon on the bottom left, um, you know, that exposes the grain to rodents, um, to wildlife. That would not be acceptable um, it, as long as it's stored in a, a closed container. It doesn't have to be a grain bin. It can be feed bags as long as um, those are taken care of and in a biosecure manner. And we have to think of how they're brought onto the site, um, you know, to make sure that we're not bringing, again, disease on the people that are bringing the feed or the equipment that's bringing the feed to the farm. What about people? Um, Secure Pork talks a lot about um, having site-specific coveralls or boots, um, taking different bio biosecurity measures. Um, you know, one thing we have to remember when people come to the farm, do we always know where they have been? And so whether it's some kind of an industry representative coming to the farm, um, whether it's a family friend, uh, that sort of thing, or, or think of where you've been, um, and the paths we cross with other people that we have to make sure that we're not exposing the rest of our animals on the farm um, to these diseases. So we talk about site-specific coveralls and boots, washing them um, correctly, um, especially if we have any animals in isolation that have been to shows or traveling, that sort of thing. I can tell you, my family and I, we raise Angus cattle. Um, my kids show cattle. Um, we have a cow-calf herd and our show cattle at the time are kept in a different buildings. My kids know they're the last chores of the day. Um, they wear specific boots into that building. They, um, they do not wear them with the cow-calf herd. And so there's things that you can do um, to reduce the risk if you have animals that are leaving, leaving the farm and coming back to make sure that you're not exposing other animals on your farm. Package deliveries is another thing. Um, do you have them delivered to a location? where we don't worry about the, um, the delivery truck driving through the farm to get to the house or to get to another barn because we know that delivery trucks um, have to go from, from um, location to location. And then once we get them, are we careful with how we dump them out um, into our buildings or transition those on to, into our animal areas? Equipment, of course, is a big one, especially if we share equipment with another site. I know we do that around here some, and we have to make sure that we clean it when it comes back. Um, you know, on-site meat processing, if it's a matter that the equipment is going from one site to another, of course, if that's coming from a site that is infected, but they're not aware yet that they're infected, and then coming to your site, there's a potential they just infected your farm. So if they're coming onto your site, is there a way that you can um, keep them away from your animals, that way you can treat that area as contaminated when they're done um, and make sure that you don't um, uh, cross paths in that area as far as human traffic, animal traffic, and so on. Is there a way that you can make that a more biosecure event? Um, carcass disposal, we uh, a lot of times here in the Midwest use rendering, um, you know, rendering cuts go between sites. So again, those types of situations with carcass disposal, manure management, any equipment we use, whether it be a skid loader and we share it with another site um, or, or different um, other types of equipment, tractors or whatnot, we have to make sure that when they come on our site that they're cleaned and disinfected so that we're not bringing um, disease with them. A little bit about that training that I had mentioned, the biosecurity training, and this is says employee biosecurity training, but it's meant to be for producers, independent producers, anyone that wants to use this training. If you already have biosecurity training that you've been through, that's great. We developed these because um, we've, we heard from people that they're, they were having trouble finding um, some different training options out there. And so it's four videos. They're, they're not too long um, that you can watch them. They help, again, that introduction as to why biosecurity is so important about not bringing disease back to your site. Um, what that perimeter buffer area is explains it in a little more detail, and then the line of separation. And in some sites, they work on using a bench entry system. I mentioned the biosecurity posters. They do come in that push pack. If you guys would like that, we can send some out your way. Again, they're laminated um, copies that, that are no charge for producers. 
and we get them in that push pack, the biosecurity posters are included um, in with those disease posters also. So writing the biosecurity plan. And as I mentioned, when I sit down with producers, um, a lot of times I'll have them bring an aerial view of their site. Um, and then we start drawing plan or drawing lines. And usually I'll ask them to bring like five different maps because what we find is we talk through things, the lines will change. So a lot of times they'll, you know, I'll say, where would you see your line of separation being? Do you see a perimeter buffer area being drawn on your site? Um, how do, you know, how do feed trucks move on your site? How do people move on your site? What about other things? Um, you know, do you have, do you crop farm too? And during harvest, you have semis coming. We just had all of our silage put up yesterday. So we had tractors back and forth uh, most of the morning um, hauling silage onto the farm. So do you have those kind of movements that we can, again, <clears throat> allow them to happen, but in a biosecure manner? And so that's what they're thinking through. They're, they're drawing their lines. Um, and then as they start to think it through, they might be, well, I think we could move, um, people could move this way through that, that entry point, or um, we could only have the feed truck go over here and, and park and unload rather than um, storing the feed in this location. You know, there's just different things that um, it's really interesting to watch their minds turn as they, as producers and sometimes contract growers, sometimes it's show pig producers, sometimes it's um, niche producers, you know, anybody, anybody can write one of these biosecurity plans. So again, we talked about reviewing those inputs and outputs for the site. And we talked about biosecurity training. So, so if it comes down to, you know, we went through a lot of stuff this afternoon here and you go, oh my gosh, how do I get started? And so a lot of times, you know, I try to help people think through, can you divide it into what can I do this month? What can I do in month one? What can I do in the next three months? What can I do in the next six months? And what are my goals to have at this time next year? And as you take those steps, um, you implement the measures and you make them part of your routine. So some examples, again, might be that site-specific coveralls or clothing and footwear. So that's one thing we do on our site with our the beef side of things is um, my kids, They I have one son that does chores for somebody else. He has a specific pairs of boots that he wears to do their chores and those boots better not be seen in my pastures um, because I don't want disease brought back. And so he has those site-specific um, coveralls and boots he wears for that. He he washes them up, but I still um, they still are not allowed in our animal enclosures. We have specific ones we wear here. They have animal or they have shoes that they um, show in that they don't wear um, anywhere else. And so you know, there's ways to think it think it through like that. Um, washing your trailer or equipment when you return back to the farm is so important to make sure you're not bringing that disease back with you. Cleaning items that cross the line of separation or into the pen. So if your animals um, have outdoor access, anytime that you carry things into their enclosure, are you making sure that it has been cleaned and disinfected and dried before you take it in to make sure you're not worrying about disease um, and, and risking those animals? So again, these are things, can I, can I do this in my month one? Can I do this and have this implemented in three months? Is this something that's on my six month plan? You know, another big thing is wildlife, restricting wildlife. Um, you know, from an FMD standpoint, we worry about um, deer carrying the disease around on their, on their feet. Um, I have animals out on pasture. I understand it's hard to secure that, but you know, what can we do to prevent wildlife from, from carrying disease around as well as rodent and fly control to make sure we have our rodent and fly control measures in place. Again, these are ideas on things you can put on that one month, three month or six month um, to-do list. The resources that I've talked about are available at securepork.org. Um, you're welcome to contact me with any questions. There's an about us tab you see at the top. Um, there's a contact us. If you click on that, um, those go to me and I would be happy to, to answer any questions if you think of them after today, but I'm also, um, would be, it'd be great to entertain what questions you have right now. I just threw a whole lot of information at you and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions or help out however I can. Do we have any questions out there? I have a question for you, Dr. Zabel. I think some people will be asking like, what type of disinfectant 
should they be utilizing on their farm when we start talking about some of these more aggressive diseases? Well, specific it, ones that you, you would push people towards? Yeah, and there's, I can share with you, um, Sarah, for your distribution, uh, there's an ASF um, approved disinfectant page through USDA. I can share that with you. Um, you know, a lot of it is so much of that getting the, um, the items clean first, right? Um, making sure we get all the fecal matter off um, and then using our appropriate disinfectants and then letting them dry. And, and the whole, that's all part of the entire process of the clean disinfect and then dry. So um, I can share that with you for your distribution. Okay, thank you. Another question I have that I, I hadn't heard about like the frozen carcasses and the depopulation and rendering and, and in Washington, um, burial is an approved way to go ahead and get rid of um, uh, mortalities. And even in some of our large areas where we have distant, great distance, you don't even have to do a full burial. So that seems like that could be problematic when we start talking about a disease like ASF. And unfortunately, we don't have many rendering companies anymore that will go farm to farm. They will only pick up at very large like feedlots. So how should we as a state start to think about managing I, I mean, we just had this summer where we had some significant losses of livestock. How do we deal with a disease that won't go away for a long time of knowing where to put that? Sure, and, and there's some concerns too with the deep burial, is the virus actually going to, are we gonna inactivate the virus? And so there is a, a lot of research still being done. Um, one thing that different groups have been looking into is composting or above ground burial. And, and what does that look like as far as the right balance of compost materials or carbon sources along with the carcass to make sure that it gets to the right temperature. And so I know that there's a lot of companies, a lot of states that are looking at that. They're looking at ways to best, um, in some situations they're talking ways to process the carcass first um, to speed up the composting process. Um, so correct grinding. So they're, they're talking about grinding um, the carcasses prior to composting. They find that they heat up much faster that way and you have to use a lot less carbon sources because of course, if everybody needs carbon sources at the same time, is there gonna be enough of that too? Um, I know right now um, the pork board is also funding, looking at, um, at new ideas for disposal. So that's um, there. It's it's uh, an effort to look beyond what we have always used as our traditional methods and looking for something unique. And so um, that's going to take a little time to do that. But they're reaching beyond the industry, trying to get some other ideas that we haven't thought of yet, too. So you're correct. Um, it's right now a lot of the states are really trying the the grinding and the composting and seeing what that looks like. Um, we're also funding some research in, in, um, in Vietnam to see too um, if there's answers there. Jamie or Ryan, do you have any questions? Uh, there's, there hasn't been any questions that came in through the um, uh, chat or the Q&A. Um, I guess a lot of this is um, knowing that our state, we have a lot of producers with just really small numbers. Um, maybe just a quick, where do I start when I really, I have, I don't have a barn, um, but I have, you know, 10, 10 sows. So very bare bones, where do I start to start getting on this path so that I'm aware of what's going on, but at the same time realizing that, um, you know, everyone involved still has other full-time jobs and just kind of, where do we start when we're really small? Sure. So I would start by, um, first of all, biosecurity training, watching those videos. They're all, I'd have to think maybe eight minutes long. We're working on redoing them right now, just to help understand some of the inputs and outputs that we really are concerned about. Um, and then the, the next thing I would start thinking about is, uh, you know, so even if there's not a building, there's a, an enclosure, <clears throat> a, a fence, whether you have a portable shed or whatnot, but um, what crosses into that space? And is everything that's crossing in there clean and disinfected? So, <clears throat> or site specific, right? 
And so back to that, um, you know, we're working on implementing secure beef on our farm and we have pastures, we have fences, you know, and how can I move people through there? How can I, um, you know, for these, these individuals, where are they storing their feed? You know, um, what other things are coming onto their farm? And so the, the print offs um, of the template kind of helps guide through the thought process. And so, you know, to your point, um, you have other jobs. Is there a way you can take it piece by piece? The first thing that I would recommend is you look at the section on protecting the pigs and the line separation. Because ultimately, you know, we can we could get the ASF virus into the country, but if it doesn't get on a farm and infect the pigs, you know, we still don't have an ASF outbreak. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, you know, when we heard ASF in uh, the Dominican Republic, you know, that sounds really close to the U.S. And granted, Florida and the Dominican Republic is a long ways from Washington State. We still have a lot of travelers and people and uh, cargo coming in from um, the Asian countries that you mentioned on that list. So your point taking that we could have had or ASF could be here, but it doesn't interact with a pig farm. So it, you know, even though we're small and we're way out here in Washington, I think um, trying to get producers to start thinking about this just in case, because um, I think a lot of us didn't think the first mad cow would happen in central Washington and Moses Lake, Washington. Um, but I can tell you it did. <laughs> and then how you have to react and uh, stuff like that. So uh, we also have some of our state officials on here. Um, I'll have to say Washington State Department of Ag has been uh, here the last year, especially the last few months, really wanting to work with the Washington pork producers to have our Washington plan in place, which is based on the National Pork Board or the National Pork Secure Pork Plan. So Mindy uh, Buswell, has been overseeing that. And if people need her access um, and information contact, we'll, we'll do that. And we'll probably do another follow-up with uh, Washington producers. We're hoping to be able to meet face-to-face -face for our February one. And, and we haven't talked about exactly what we're doing, but maybe that discussion where you say we bring pictures, aerials and start to try to work through some of those might be a good thing over, um, heavy hors d'oeuvres, um, Jamie Sackman, who's our treasurer. Um, yeah, right. Uh, 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 Cosmic Crisp and Cougar Gold and um, some bacon. The bacon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think you've challenged me. I'd like to go back to the template and see if I can pull out specific um, pieces that I think maybe would be a good place for you to start. It's numbered to help you kind of focus in on, on where I think progress could, could really be made. Yeah, that would be great because I'm thinking like even if, you know, we usually meet for a day and if we could spend two hours just like telling some people to bring some things and just make either a simple outline of some of those, you know, watch some of those um, biosecurity and then write some things, maybe we could leave with something to start our toolbox and start implementation. So, and I also appreciate also coming from a mixed species um, operation, appreciate the approach of um, this is following similar lines with different species and also understanding that we have ASF isn't the only disease we're watching um, and to be aware that all these things uh, play together. Um, and I think same thing, you know, and even as we get here into Washington, um, even if I have pigs, I might have a neighbor who's only a mile away that's a 40,000 head feedlot. So just being aware of the whole situation versus just your own place. Yeah. Well, with that, we're right up on three o'clock and unless there's any other questions, um, I will wrap it up. I thank you, Dr. Zabel. Um, please, any information that you can help us start taking our, I kind of feel like this is an elephant. If we can start eating it one piece at a time, and start implementing it. Hopefully we'll never have to use it, but if we do, we'll at least have something to, to start running. And, and like I said, unfortunately, unfortunately, I've now been in this job 20, 21 years. And
and I've got to be involved with a number of state quarantines. And when the quarantine comes, it's very stressful. So anytime we can ha understand the protocol that's gonna start and what we can do, um, it's easier to work through that than to try to start from ground zero and nothing. So that's kind of why, even though I know this isn't the most favorite topic or some of the most demanded, I'm hoping that we'll at least have a running start so that we will be better to keep any diseases out, but in the event uh, some unfortunate um, foreign animal disease makes it here, we will at least start to be ready. So with that, I will tell you, you will have a survey that will pop up when you click off of this. Um, also, we did record this because we did have a number of people that wanted to uh, watch, but were at fairs. So, um, I should see the recording come across my email here in the next 30 minutes to an hour. We'll get that edited down and we'll send those links back out. And we are creating a YouTube page that will have all the webinar series. So you can go back and watch webinar one, or you can come back and watch this webinar um, and, and glean more information as we do. So with that, I know it's five o'clock somewhere, like maybe Iowa and South Dakota. And it's probably fair season back there for you too. And it sounds like the big game is coming up. So we're gonna let you guys get going. We appreciate you guys from the Midwest reaching out here and helping us uh, navigate this from the swine perspective. And we will be back on here October 8th with reproductive and artificial insemination with Dr. Ryan Sams um, from South Dakota State University. So with that, thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Okay, have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.